Bueno, pues hola a todos, esta es la entrevista que querías ver, este es el vídeo que querías ver. Este hombre trabaja en el departamento de búsqueda y descubrimiento de YouTube. O sea, sé que este hombre es como si estuviesen entrevistando ahora mismo a YouTube en persona. Todo lo que diga este hombre vale millones. Hello insiders, this week I have a very special guest. I got Todd from the search and discovery team with me today. Welcome Todd. Thanks for having me. Now Todd, people have been asking for this interview ever since we started the channel. So I'm super excited to kind of dig in a little bit to help people understand a little bit around how we recommend videos and, and how we think about that. Um, maybe we could just start by going over, like what is the goal of, of the search and discovery team? Like why do you guys exist? Yeah, so there's, uh, you know, as you know, there's over 400 hours of video being uploaded to YouTube every minute. So that's, uh, I think like 72 uh, days worth of content per day. And given that each person probably only has an hour or two to watch YouTube every day, it's our job to help them find what they want to watch. And not just what they're going to watch, but what they're going to want to enjoy and uh, keep them coming back to YouTube um, every day to, to watch more videos. So uh, really understand each viewer what they like and give them the videos that they're going to find engaging. So how do you how do you solve that problem? That sounds like a very kind of ambitious goal like how do you break that down into a mental model yeah so the way we think about it is our job is to follow the audience mm -hmm. because uh, by listening to the audience we're, we'll do a better job of giving them what they want so the way we think about the systems that we build is that they're really a gigantic feedback loop for the audience in mm -hmm. any given day we collect over 80 billion different pieces of feedback from the audience Um, we look at things like, well, what did they watch? What did, what did we recommend that they decided not to watch? How long did they watch for? But increasingly, uh, we're moving beyond just watch time as one of our key goals. We look at satisfaction signals, like did they like it? Did they dislike it? When we recommended it on the homepage, did they say they were not interested? We give viewers the ability to tell us that. Uh, so we can stop recommending certain types of videos that they didn't like. Um, and recently we even started using surveys to try to even better understand the audience and what they like and don't like. So we send out uh, tens of thousands of surveys every day to people, hmm. uh, asking them whether the recommendations we're giving them are good or not, uh, as well as following up with people after they've watched a video to find out how enjoyable that video was. Was it one of the best videos they've ever seen or was it kind of an average video? Uh, because we believe that not every minute spent on YouTube is probably equally valued. Um, and we want to be able to, to really recognize when viewers have a, maybe even a life-changing moment with a video so that we can recommend more videos like that. Cool. Now you've been on the team for three years. Yeah. Uh, I'm guessing you've seen a lot of interesting experiments and the the work that the team does has evolved over time. Could you share some examples of changes that have been made and, and maybe why you guys thought about making those changes? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, changes are happening all the time uh, because we're always trying to get better about giving people the right uh, content that they're going to find satisfying. At any given time, we probably have several do dozen different experiments running with different changes that we think might um, help improve engagement and satisfaction. Um, but we're also very careful about how many of those experiments make it into the final product. Um, each experiment gets tested with millions of viewers. Um, so we really want to see how it does before we roll it out to everyone. And only a minority of those changes do we, do we put into the final product and we go through a review process for every change. Um, and we look at dozens of metrics. I know that a lot of creators have kind of asked me, well, what's the one thing that I should focus on mm -hmm. to be successful on YouTube? Is it watch time? Is it likes? Is mm -hmm. it comments? Um, and what we found over time is... I've even asked you that question. You have asked me that <laughs> question. Yeah. And as you probably remember, yeah. uh, I, I've said that, you know, while I wish I could give you a simple <laughs> answer, mm -hmm. what we've learned to truly understand the audience and what they want is not just about just looking at one thing like watch time or likes because, 
you know, for example, with, with watch time, you know, we've come across some changes in the past that we've considered. Like, uh, we had this one change recently that, um, significantly increased watch time across YouTube. It actually, um, if we would have rolled out this change, people would have watched millions more hours every day mm. on YouTube. So you might think, well, obviously that's one of the good ones. Let's, let's roll that one out. But when we looked at the dozens of metrics we looked at, for each change, we found that um, there were some interesting things happening uh, that weren't the same across all viewers. What was happening is, one, we were recommending longer videos on average. Mm -hmm. So you might see more videos that are like an hour long or more. Um, but our hit rate in terms of like how often uh, a viewer would find a video they mm -hmm. want to watch was lower. So. You'd be less likely to find a video, but when you did find one you liked, you might watch for longer. Mm -hmm. So overall watch time is up. But what was ultimately happening when we dug in was we were increasing engagement with a small, heavy segment mm -hmm. uh, of the audience and actually reducing engagement from a casual user segment. Mm -hmm. And because we look not just at like the total volume of engagement, we also break it out and see how it's affecting different groups of viewers. Um, and we care about growing the appeal of YouTube to more and more viewers over time, we felt that this wasn't representative of the type of change we wanted to make because it was actually making the experience worse mm -hmm. for um, you know a significant segment of viewers that we cared about. And so rather than make them pay the price for, for another segment, we said, let's go back and see if we can find a way to get, get the improvements here without hurting it for a different segment. So we look at these things very closely and, you know, spend hours a week digging mm -hmm. into the, the details. Um, but ultimately it does change a lot in, in a given year, you know, 200 to 300 changes do, uh, end up happening. So it's, it's a lot to keep up with, but, um, you know, each change that we do roll out, we can be confident that we're, we're making the experience better. Yeah. Um, I think in reality, it's a little more nuanced than that. Um, can maybe what we could do is talk about specific spots within YouTube where recommendations are made. Like there's homepage, there's watch next, there is uh, trending, uh, search as well. Maybe could we uh, step through, like starting with homepage, how do you think about that problem, solving that problem of recommendation, and then we can move on to the others? Sounds great. Yeah. So, um, yeah, a lot of people talk about it as if it's just like one algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, and we do have different systems, um, and each um, surface or feature that the user sees kind of has its own set of systems behind it that are trying to optimize for uh, whatever that feature is trying to achieve. So for example, on the home page, um, we are really trying to be the one-stop destination. So it's the first thing you see when you open it up on mm -hmm. your mobile app or type youtube.com into your browser. We really want to be as efficient as possible in helping you find something, whether it's a trending video or whether it's something by your favorite creator. Um, we want to get you there as quickly as possible so you don't have to navigate around the app to find what you're looking for. So we're going to pull in videos from all sorts of different sources to mm -hmm. try to find the ones that are going to resonate with you. So we'll pull in uh, recent videos from the channels you subscribe to. We'll pull in... Um, videos that have been watched by people who tend to watch the same sorts of videos you do. Um, and um, we'll also pull in uh, a few videos from channels you may have never watched before. It's actually a great place for channels to get discovered by people who aren't already subscribed to their channel. Mm -hmm. We found that um, you know, the homepage actually used to be only your subscriptions. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes we'll get the question from creators or people internally asking, well, why don't we just, you know, since people have subscribed to those mm -hmm. channels, why don't we just, uh, you know, give them what they subscribe to? Mm -hmm. um, we used to do that. Um, and uh, as we've introduced more and not constrained the homepage to videos you've, you know, manually opted into, added more recommendations, the, the engagement has grown dramatically. And so we, we try to include both familiar content as well as uh, discovery content. And 
uh, every once in a while we'll kind of retest to make sure that uh, we've made the right decision there and we'll run another one of those experiments mm -hmm. with millions of users where we actually give them just the subscriptions when they start up the app um, and we've done that several times since we made that change and every time we see dramatic drops mm. um, in engagement on home when uh, when we limit it just to subscriptions. So that's, if you, if you had that question about why isn't it only subscriptions, it's because when we show that, people actually visit YouTube less often, mm. um, which is not really what we're going for. So uh, home is really that personalized one-stop shop that's supposed to bring the most relevant of YouTube to you without you having to type a query or navigate around the app. Great. And I guess if for those who viewers who are super interested in just the people they're subscribed to, there is always the subscriptions tab. That's right. right. It's just one tap away. Yeah. There's a subscription tab that filters down to the stuff yeah. that you've um, um, subscribed to. And it's uh, we, we still offer that for mm -hmm. the people who want to just jump into that as well. Cool. Um, what about Watch Next? So Watch Next. Um, that's what we call it in, in our team. Mm -hmm. Externally, sometimes people call it suggested videos. Mm -hmm. The recommendations you see on the sidebar while yep. you're watching a video on desktop. Um, this is one of our most powerful recommendation areas. Uh, drives a huge amount of engagement on YouTube. Um, kind of similar to how we call it Watch Next, we're trying to find the next thing you wanna watch. So unlike the homepage, which is really centered around you only, mm -hmm. um, we have some additional context of what you're currently watching now. And so uh, that's going to sometimes influence what you want to watch next. So we're going to we're going to pull in some different videos. We're going to pull in more videos from the channel that you're watching. We're going to um, pull in videos that people who watch the video you're watching, what else did they watch? Mm -hmm. That's a key. That's a key part of it. Um, we're going to pull in similar videos that have like similar titles and mm -hmm. keywords and descriptions that might be similar. Um, and finally, we're not just going to limit it to uh, videos that are related to the video you're just watching. This is another change that's happened over the years. It used to be called related videos mm. because we thought that that was kind of like the, the thing that would work the best. And what we found through our experiments is that in addition to showing related videos, if we also show personalized recommendations that mm. might be interesting to you, but not directly related to what you're watching, people will watch more. Um, and so sometimes you want, might want to go down the rabbit hole on mm -hmm. a video and watch more related, but other times it's like, hey, I was just looking up how to tie a bow tie mm -hmm. and I got that information and now what I want to watch next is actually I want to catch up on my favorite uh, vlogger or mm -hmm. some other channel. So we don't, we don't limit uh, suggested video. So it's a mix of stuff that might be related and 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 what's relevant to you and ultimately what determines what shows up there is what performs the best. So uh, the videos that you see there are the ones that we think are most likely to drive uh, viewers to watch and, and engage and the 80 billion data points that I talked about earlier mm -hmm. uh, a lot of those data points come from there so we just you know try to keep doing what's working and uh, tests various videos in different placements and the ones that work the best tend to stick around and the ones that don't tend to um, not. All right, so now we've talked about home, uh, watch next, uh, let's talk about search. Right, so search, uh, similar to Watch Next, mm -hmm. we have some more context there because mm -hmm. you've given us a query. So um, in general, we're gonna you know, start with what you'd imagine, which is we're gonna find videos that match that query, uh, either in the title or the descriptions, or maybe we've seen that um, people who search for this query tend to, tend to watch these sorts of videos. Mm -hmm. um, and so we'll start with a set of, of relevant videos and then similar to what I, I was referring to earlier, there's this feedback loop. Mm -hmm. So you might say, hey, I have a thumbnail of an iPhone and uh, I have the text iPhone in my thumbnail and my title is all about iPhone review. And in my description, I say iPhone, iPhone, iPhone. Um, why am I not number one in the search for iPhone? Well, it's because we don't only look at 
um, what we call the metadata that you mm -hmm. provide about the video, but we also look at the performance. And so, um, we're going to see when people search for iPhone, is this the type of video that they tend to watch or not? Mm -hmm. And so the ones that you're gonna see at the top aren't just the ones that match the query, but also match what the feedback has been from viewers. Um, so uh, it's a combination of relevance and then that feedback loop of, of what's, what's actually engaging the audience. Cool, and then trending. Trending, this yeah. one we get so many questions about. Yeah. Um, so trending is, you know, one of the things that we built trending around was to be kind of like the water cooler of YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not just a popular list. It's not the most popular videos that are getting the most views or that sort of thing. A lot of people get confused and think that's what it is. Um, we really wanted to be represent the videos that people are having a conversation about. Mm -hmm. um, and when you think about that, what are the types of videos that people are talking about at the water cooler? They tend to be broadly appealing videos. Like, so there may be, you know, a video that's getting a lot of views, but it's within sort of like a really um, narrow audience. Mm -hmm. Like people may not be talking about that broadly. Um, so we are, we do tend to focus trending on videos that are broadly appealing, um, for example, to different types of people with mm -hmm. different preferences. Um, and we're also looking at videos that aren't just, don't just have a lot of views in the past, but are actually, uh, have some velocity and mm -hmm. are increasing and on the rise. Um, so that's why you might see videos in trending that, you know, may not have millions of views yet, but we're trying to actually identify those things as they're taking off. Um, and we also look at things like, um, are people talking about this video on the web, do we see that, hey, this was actually uh, embedded in uh, you know, a lot of different news articles. Mm -hmm. And so there are conversations happening outside of YouTube about these videos. Uh, those are some of the things we looked at it's to try to tap into that water cooler um, element. Cool. Uh, you know, one thing I've heard people ask about trending is um, whether uh, the, the suggestions are paid. Yeah, I've heard that question as well. Um, so we, we feel really strongly that any, um, advertisements that we have on YouTube are clearly indicated as ads. You'll mm -hmm. see like a little yellow badge that says ad, mm -hmm. um, same goes for trending. There aren't any of those in mm -hmm. trending. Um, and that's because we don't have those ads in trending. We don't, uh, have any programs where, uh, partners or advertisers mm -hmm. can pay us to place the videos in trending. It's not a, it's not a pay for placement thing so all the videos you see in trending there are are because of the um, the ranking that we've come up with um, and there's no way for uh, people to pay to influence that so now and like you mentioned they're uploading hundreds of hours uh, you know a minute kind of thing um, how does one stand out like as an example, if I wanted to do a bow tie video, mm -hmm. there's probably like, I don't know, maybe hundreds, maybe more on YouTube. Um, what, what sort of advice would you give a creator who's trying to think through his or her content strategy and, and, and how, to, how to maximize their chances of, of breaking through? Right, so I, I would go back to you know, how we think about you know, delivering the right videos to people is we tend to follow the audience. So we kind of put ourselves in the shoes of the viewers and think mm -hmm. about, well, what would they want? And if there's already hundreds of bow tie videos, then does the audience want another bow tie video? Um, you know, I often think about this in the same way I would think about any kind of business strategy as well. Like if you're gonna open up a restaurant in San Francisco and there's already 200 pizza restaurants, what would your strategy be for opening a new restaurant? Would you just open yet another pizza restaurant? If so, how would you be successful? Mm -hmm. Well, the way that you might be successful is by doing something different that mm -hmm. isn't already being addressed 
by um, everyone else. Um, so I would be thinking about, well, is there actually something around how to tie a bow tie that hasn't been covered? Because mm -hmm. if there isn't, you're probably, you know, why, why, would, um, why would the viewers want to watch your video versus another video? So if I, if I were opening a restaurant in, in San Francisco, I might think about, well, you know, maybe protein bowls. Maybe that's some a new type of food that people are that might, might be interested in. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm personally interested in that, but yeah. maybe there's a more room in the market for right. something like that than yet another pizza restaurant. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes you want to be looking at the trends to kind mm -hmm. of get a sense of what people like. Yeah, people love pizza, um, and there may be a new trend. But uh, you also have to think about the competition and how much room there is. Yeah. And how do you position yourself relative to all the other videos that are there? Like if you're doing one on, you know, I was talking to a creator at VidCon who was asking me, how do I, I want to do a sunscreen video. How do I get to the top of the search results on sunscreen? And I was mm -hmm. like, well, we have a lot of great sunscreen videos already. Um, what? Why should your video be at yeah. the top of the search results? Is it going to be the best one? Is it going to be better than all these ones we already have? Or, you know, maybe there's a different way you could look at this. Like, um, maybe no one has done a video about um, sunscreens for various skin tones. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, and I haven't researched sunscreens to know like mm -hmm. what the best thing is for the audience. But I would really look to find find an opportunity. The opportunities are going to be there where somebody hasn't already you know, delivered what the audience wants. So if you want to, if you want to give the, you want to grow, you want to um, be the best, maybe start, start with something a bit more specific that hasn't been covered um, and then use that to then expand into broader areas and build your reputation around a broader topic. Cool. Speaking of documentation, I think your team worked on a Creator Academy video or yeah. lesson? Yeah. Yeah. So we've been trying to improve our communication mm -hmm. with creators because we realize that search and discovery is sometimes a bit of a mystery. And so uh, we recently worked um, to uh, on some new training material about how uh, search and discovery works. So I think if, if you don't mind putting in the description of this video a link mm -hmm. to the uh, Creator Academy lesson that we just refreshed um, this past month, uh, I encourage everybody to check that out. We have some quizzes in there to try to make it a little bit fun for you to uh, see how well you know search and discovery. Hopefully you'll, you'll learn something by giving that a try. Cool. And you were recently at VidCon as well, right? Yes. What, what do you think were some of the more kind of uh, surprising questions that you got or uh, more thought-provoking kind of conversations you had where you took something away from it to kind of help you think, think about it differently? Yeah, so um, when I talk to creators, it's, you know, I'm frequently looking at this problem of connecting viewers to videos from the viewer's point of view. It's like, mm -hmm. how do we make the viewer as happy as possible? And at places like VidCon, I often talk more to creators, and they're often looking at it from a different perspective, from their channel perspective, mm -hmm. and thinking about well, all the actions that they can do that might influence how they connect with the audience. There was, you know, some of the questions we got were just things that I hadn't really considered. Mm -hmm. Like, someone was asking if my um, video doesn't have any uh, talking in it, like, mm. how does that impact my discovery? Mm. And so, uh, how does that impact his discovery? Uh, it's a good <laughs> question. It's not something that I had really thought about before. Yeah. So a lot of times, these questions highlight different um, things that creators are trying out with, mm -hmm. and uh, that we haven't thought of. Um, and so it, it gives us new ideas for, you know, our, do we have all the right information mm -hmm. in the system such that if we get this type of video in, are we going to be able to find the audience that's going to be interested in it? Mm -hmm. You know, other questions like, well, I have um, Spanish and English videos, and I'm trying to figure out whether I should have two channels or one channel, mm -hmm. and um, what's going to work best. Um, usually, the answer that I give to that is, you know, I usually don't have specific expertise mm -hmm. on, on some of these. Uh, cases, but it's the answer I usually say is, well, what is working with the audience? Mm -hmm. If you look at your data in YouTube analytics, mm -hmm. which I highly recommend people spend time in, are do you generally find that it that um, 
like if you can look at your geography and see where people are watching from is it the same audience that's watching your spanish videos mm -hmm. as your english videos if it is then probably makes sense to have it on the same channel mm -hmm. because you're kind of a channel is a way to program to a to an audience but if mm -hmm. you you're finding that you're actually programming to two different audiences with the same channel that's where you're going to probably want to think about separating them so that for example if somebody wants to subscribe they can get the type of content that they want only and not um, the content that doesn't match um, so generally just lots of yeah. questions from uh, a different point of view than than I'm used to thinking about from the viewer perspective so great sounds like it was helpful for you always. as well oh, VidCon yeah. is always a, an eye opening experience whether it's talking to creators or seeing stars um, and the reactions that the fans have there it's it's always exciting who knows maybe in the next VidCon people will recognize you and I think it's going to be you, you. You're, you're the creator insider <laughs> uh, host there so. you go yeah we'll see about that one yeah, yeah. Um, well Thank you so much for spending time with us. I know that um, hopefully people will find this interview helpful. And uh, we always encourage people to uh, give us feedback and ask questions in the comments. And so what we'll try to do, like we do with every video, is answer as many of them as we can. And I'll definitely consult with you, Todd, uh, where I can to, to make sure I Nada, say the right things and, and give the right information. Está. Y bueno, hasta aquí ha llegado la entrevista. Ya sabes, si te ha gustado el video, dale un like compártelo, suscríbete al canal y bueno, nos vemos ya en el siguiente gameplay. Chao.